My name is Ron McNamara. On behalf of our chairman, uh, Senator uh, Carton, and our co-chairman, Congressman Allison Hastings, I welcome you to today's briefing of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe regarding developments in the state of the media in the Russian Federation. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Kyle Parker, who's uh, serving as our analyst for developments in the Russian Federation. I'll share a few brief opening remarks and then certainly recognize any members of the Commission or members of Congress who might uh, appear this morning. And then Kyle will do an introduction of our special uh, guest today. As with all Commission briefings, uh, there will be a full transcription of today's proceedings posted on the Commission's website, which is www.cse.gov. In addition, should time permit, we will entertain questions from the audience. We ask that you do keep your questions distinct, uh, provide uh, your name for the transcription purposes, and any affiliation that you might have. So we'll see if time permits. As, excuse me, ask Prime Minister Putin about the state of media in the Russian Federation, and he is likely to launch into a barrage of statistics that would make an apparatch from the Soviet planning agency proud. But the numbers, this numbers game is merely a diversionary tactic aimed at overwhelming the bothersome questioner and masking the truth about the gradual yet steady erosion of independent journalism in Russia since his assumption of power a decade ago. This is not to suggest that there were not challenges during the tumultuous 1990s, a period which witnessed upheaval as well as conflict that raged for much of the decade in the North Caucasus. Putin's pursuit of what he and his Kremlin colleagues term managed democracy has taken its toll on Russia's democratic development and key elements of civil society, especially human rights defenders and independent journalists. One of its growing list of victims, Anna Politkovskaya, once quit, my job is simple, to look around and write what I see. Like her, scores of her colleagues, including Paul Klebnikov, have paid for their journalistic pursuits with their lives. The harsh reality is that those who venture into sensitive subjects, such as human rights abuses or corruption, run the risk of sharing that fate. Investigations are open, rarely leading to arrest, and even rarer to prosecution. At least a handful of Russian journalists have been killed in the past year alone. Among them, journalists and human rights activist Natalia Estaromirova. Meanwhile, Russia's information space for independent media outlets, newspapers, radio, and television continues to shrink, with Russians increasingly migrating to blogs and other technologies to fill the void. We are fortunate to welcome to the Helsinki Commission today several of Russia's remaining independent journalists, committed to pursuit of their professional activities in an often hostile and potentially dangerous environment. Before turning uh, to my colleague Kyle Parker, I did want to make a special um, note of appreciation to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, for their assistance uh, with uh, the witnesses and today's program. Just um, going back a little bit in my own involvement in the Helsinki process, when I was uh, detailed to Vienna in the late 1980s, it was a rather strange dynamic. One of the issues I was dealing with was a free flow of information. Uh, most of the Western broadcasts, including RFERL's broadcasts, were uh, jammed at the time. And there was a erstwhile RFERL correspondent, uh, Roland Eggleston, uh, who dutifully covered the proceedings. But my Soviet colleagues refused to even sit down and to speak with him. 
So after each of our negotiating sessions, I'd go over and speak to them, uh, to uh, the RFERL correspondent, when the Soviet course colleagues would walk by and I'd occasionally say, well, wouldn't you like to give your own uh, take on today's discussions or what have you? And they utterly refused and, and swore that there would never be uh, a secession of jamming uh, of foreign broadcasts. Well, we're thankfully have moved significantly past that step uh, or, or phase in, in development. However, there are troublesome aspects of the media environment today, and we look forward to the presentations of our expert <coughs> panelists. So I'll turn to uh, Kyle Parker for uh, any additional comments and then the introduction of our experts today. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I would also add that, uh, that the proceedings are being televised in the House TV system and will be later posted on YouTube for anyone who wants to review them or someone who might not uh, be able to, to be here. Um, we will start off with Dmitry Muratov, uh, and the bios should be outside and also on our website, but uh, just a few words. Um, uh, Mr. Muratov is the editor in chief of Nova Gazeta, which is an independent Russian newspaper widely acclaimed for its critical and investigative reporting. Mr. Morozov helped found the newspaper in 1993 before taking his helm in 1995. In the mid-1980s, he was an editor for Komsomolskaya Pravda. Uh, Mr. Morozov and his colleagues at Nova Gazeta have been awarded numerous journalistic and human rights prizes. In 2007, he was recognized by the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists for his courageous fight for press freedom. Since 2000, Nova Gazeta journalists Igor Domnikov, Yuri Shekachikin, Anna Polikovskaya and Anastasia Baburova were killed in response to their work. Um, it's certainly a great privilege and an honor to have uh, you here today. Um, I, I, I might I might note that you know Yuri your, Shevchikin was was well known here in Congress and had taken part in a number of exchanges through the Open World Program uh, in '99, I think 2000, uh, and, and had a lot of friends among our commissioners. Uh, in, among, throughout the halls of Congress here. So uh, we, we certainly are, are very happy to have you here and welcome any remarks you have uh, for us today. <coughs> Mr. Morel. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a few questions about your former colleagues, but then about how the Gazette sees the political situation in my country. All right, thank you. Uh, well, then maybe um, let me say a few words about my uh, parish friends and colleagues, and then I will uh, say a few words about how uh, we see the current uh, situation in Russia um, from the vantage point of our newspaper. Uh, uh, Yuri Shikachikin uh, was um, a member of the Russian parliament, the state uh, Duma, and of course a head of uh, the uh, Duma Committee on Combating Corruption. One boom, one boom, one boom, one boom, one boom. He was my best friend. Он погиб за семь дней, на нем не осталось кожи. He died in seven days, and he had no skin on him. У него не осталось волос. His hair was gone. Он постарел за неделю на 30-40 лет. In one week he aged 30 or 40 years. Уголовное дело по факту отравления Щекочителя было возбуждено только после вмешательства Медведева спустя 6 лет после того, как его погибли. Criminal investigation Yuri's uh, death uh, was launched only six years after the fact that her um, personal interference uh, by uh, President Dmitry Medvedev. Um, Yuri was investigating a um, major uh, smuggling affair that was involved in uh, contraband smuggling of weapons and uh, furniture. And people who um, uh, were 
able to stop this investigation are uh, now um, in uh, high places. Uh, they are uh, senators and, and uh, members of the parliament, uh, and uh, their names are Mirkov and Kolesnikov. В рамках расследования этого дела стало известно, что пропало около 50 зарядов сильнейших отравляющих веществ со склада бывшего КГБ. And um, uh, in part, this investigation revealed the theft, um, the loss of over 50 charges of uh, highly uh, toxic uh, substances uh, from the stockpiles of the KGB. Об этом нам сообщил следователь по делу, который сейчас срочно уволен на пенсию. Uh, this is uh, what I learned uh, from uh, an investigator who was assigned to this case and who was hastily uh, retired. <coughs> история болезни Чикачихина странным образом оказалась утерянной. Это история болезни депутата, погибшего от таинственной болезни синдрома Лаева. Она оказалась утерянной. Так не будет. And um, the uh, uh, medical charts and the medical records and history of Yuri Shikachina um, somehow also got misplaced or lost. And you can imagine this is a medical chart of a, a member of a national uh, a parliament who was diagnosed with a very rare disease, Lyola uh, disease, and somehow he can't find uh, this uh, uh, medical records. Совсем недавно, к сожалению, результатов уже не дала. И то это стало возможно, повторяю, только после того, как вмешался новый президент. Um, uh, Очень медленно идет расследование смерти известной всем нам нашего обозревателя Ани Политковской. Кто-то, неизвестно кто, подозреваемого в убийстве Политковской выдал паспорт, по которому убийца смог покинуть территорию России уже после того, как был объявлен в розыск Интерпола. Somebody, and of course nobody knows who that somebody is, issued a travel document, a passport um, to the person who was suspected uh, in um, killing him, Polikovsky, and he was able to leave the country after this person's name uh, was placed on most wounded uh, lists of both um, in the country and uh, uh, by the Interpol. Я очень рассчитываю, что у новой власти, в отличие от предыдущей, хватит смелости и политической воли, чтобы раскрыть это преступление. Ко всем просьбам, на любой пресс-конференции, на любой встрече, должностными лицами Российской Федерации, не забывайте задавать эти вопросы. And I would like to ask you a huge favor. In every meeting, in any encounter with representatives of Russian political establishment uh, and government, please bring up this issue. Please you know, ask uh, these comfortable uh, questions. Please, uh, you know, uh, try not to be uh, you know, too polite. Yeah. Uh, You don't have uh, to be friends with uh, murderers in order to be successful in trading oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murata. We certainly uh, carry, carry your suggestion back to our, to our bosses, to our commissioners. Russia's at Moscow Radio, 
Uh, Mr. Trudeluba was awarded the 2007 Paul Pimnikov Integrity and Journalism Fellowship. And is currently at Yale University where he was selected to participate in the 2009 Yale World Fellows Program. Uh, Mr. Trudeluba is on the Russian panel of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council. Mr. Trudeluba, your remarks? Words about the newspaper. It's um, it's a national business daily, just like the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. Uh, so we're catering to uh, business audience and top politicians, uh, and younger people who are involved in uh, pursuing careers in business. Um, but we have an opinion page, which is one of the very few in Russia. Uh, this whole concept of an editorial and opinion page is relatively new in Russia. Uh, we had to uh, actually, in a way, present it uh, because Russia's uh, tradition of, of journalism uh, doesn't really uh, divide between uh, fact and opinion. And we had to, with time and effort, to uh, explain, uh, to show, uh, to our audience, even even the educated and uh, enfranchised uh, audience that we have, that there, it's, it's an important concept of distinguishing between news and uh, commentary on facts. Uh, on facts. And uh, I, I, I guess we've been relatively successful, although the the whole concept is not really. Uh, developing very well simply because uh, most uh, media are heavily controlled in uh, all kinds of ways. But I think that uh, a, an encouraging sign uh, uh, it, it is that uh, opinion and discussion uh, is, has become really important, uh, much more important than it used to be. Uh, we, we, our, our opinion page yeah, has got more visibility for the past year or two, uh, which probably means that people start to think more and start to uh, get, get getting more serious about um, uh, crucial issues, uh, because we are about crucial issues of uh, policy, economic policy, uh, freedom of speech, uh, human rights, that's what we um, I strongly agree with Vichy uh, Murad, and uh, I, 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 I just want to put my, my own voice behind this uh, as well, because uh, it's not much that foreign uh, uh, external forces may do for, uh, for Russia's situation. The freedom of speech is our internal it's most of the things we're dealing with are our internal things. We, we, uh, we have to deal with them ourselves. But uh, when we're talking about uh, people who've been killed uh, uh, on, on, uh, on their duty, uh, being journalists, investigators, that's important that uh, Russian authorities uh, do not forget uh, that, uh, that, uh, people, that there are other people Broad who care about it, uh, and they don't forget that there is a system of coordinates, a system, a, a moral compass, as it were, in the world uh, that good and evil are still, you know, considered good and evil. But that's, uh, I think is very important for uh, for us who, who work in Russia and for uh, for for people who are in journalistic profession in Russia to to feel that. that uh, this um, all com Congress does exist, and we still have, uh, we still live in a world where good is good and evil is good. Uh, and one last thing is uh, the, the, <coughs> something that we notice: uh, the, the attitudes changing uh, in uh, 
obviously the current administration in the U.S. is doing uh, a lot of new things, and uh, uh, many of the policies of the past administration are also uh, 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 rejected. Um, but um, when we see uh, 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 things like uh, an editor of an American magazine advising, uh, it, it's uh, it's uh, probably somebody heard there was a story in a, in a magazine uh, published in the, in the United States by Condé Nast. They had a, they carried the story on uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, their 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 uh, internal um, law department uh, uh, legal department advised. Than not to carry, carry that story in Russia. That's uh, this JQ. That's uh, a, a magazine published by Contrast. And uh, so they they asked and uh, they, they basically uh, asked their Russian edition not to run that story on uh, Putin in, in Russia, which is a case of uh, American uh, company caring about their business in Russia and at the same time forsaking uh, values, uh, values of um, freedom of speech, uh, uh, which is one little example. Uh, it, it happens a lot with China, as you, as you all know, because uh, business is business. And, uh, um, uh, but this is, uh, uh, this is something that uh, uh, troubles and war worrying for, for us uh, who, who, who work in Russia, who deal with, uh, who have to deal with a very hostile environment uh, where people don't, many people don't understand what freedom of speech is for simply because they're not allowed to, uh, to sort of try and test the effect of, um, uh, of media on of media as uh, as a check and as a check on government that's important um, cause that we're pursuing and we need some support so some moral support from uh, the outside world thank you thank you uh, and finally here we will turn to uh, Roberta Schiff uh, who's director of Caucasian Non www.kafkaz.memo.group Yeah, just the uh, occasion not involved. Okay, okay. okay. That's the whole view. Oh, that's the whole view. Okay. Uh, an independent media service which provides news and information on the northern and southern Caucasus. Uh, Mr. Shvetla is also director of the Memo.group Information Agency, which focuses on new strategies and mobilizing public opinion. Directed numerous projects on social marketing techniques. Since 1999, he's held several posts with uh, human rights organizations. Uh, with Memorial, he's currently serving as a board member of the International Memorial and a representative in Memorial's Moscow office. Uh, in 2002 to 2006, he supervised the organization's regional network of 70 branches in Russia and other countries of the former Soviet Union. He is also a previous uh, witness at, uh, our, at a hearing on that uh, in Bushetia we did a couple of years ago. Um, Mr. Shredov is really probably the best there is inside or outside of government on current reliable information on the turbulent North Caucasus. Someone who is able to travel throughout these regions, uh, which, which certainly uh, is, is fairly complicated logistically and takes uh, no small amount of courage these days. But, with the, uh, the violence uh, that takes place there. Uh, someone who's given, I think he had a recent five hour sit down with the president of Pakistan. So, so a person with great access uh, and during the question and answer period, please, our topic is free media, but we have a world renowned expert on the caucuses, which is of great interest to this commission. Please feel free to post him uh, some questions on that topic. Uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank you very much. I was presented uh, two complimentary. Uh, 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 thank you. 
Well, I would uh, try to address uh, the two main uh, points of it now. I would uh, like to share what's going on here in the Caucasus, um, most of all in, uh, in the Northern Caucasus, and then I would uh, come up with some specific ideas uh, for what might be done. Um, first of all, on what's going on right now. Unfortunately, we do see that from the time uh, then um, we've been um, uh, talking here in the hearings uh, in uh, June of uh, 2008, uh, the situation in the Northern Caucasus became no less a challenge. It's still the region which is very important to recognize not just a part of Russian Federation, it is a part of Russian Federation, but as a region where human rights violations are mass and cruel, it is a part uh, of the world which really requests attention from the people in this room, in many other auditoriums, because unfortunately this uh, region is a region where uh, the, uh, the rights of the freedom of uh, the religion, the rights to the freedom of the free from torture, the rights of uh, even such rights uh, as a freedom on, on to believe uh, are violated. Our, our colleagues and friends have been killed. That was mentioned already, uh, Natalia Stimirova, uh, the person who worked a lot uh, in memorial and uh, provided enormous uh, materials to Human Rights Watch uh, for their reports. After that, two other uh, activists of NGO have been killed uh, in Chechnya just recently, uh, this month. Um, another a colleague of ours in Angushetia, um, Shari Paushev, um, was killed. Uh, and we do see that uh, this wave of uh, killings is not something new happening in the region. We do see that at least we in civil society in Russia, my colleagues publicly said that we share responsibility for their killings because before those people, even the NGOs have been killed. It was a numerous number of killings among just regular people who have been announced to be a terrorist, who have been announced to be a rebel. In some cases, definitely, we do unfortunately have a terrorists and rebels in the region. And in some cases, uh, terrorists <coughs> and rebels have been killed, but even by the Russian laws, it's not allowed to kill a person, um, uh, even if he is seen as a terrorist or rebel. Uh, it should be a decision of a court. The person should be uh, taken to prison. In many cases, before the killings which uh, increased that much this summer, we uh, seen dozens and dozens of people kidnapped and killed. And our responsibility, I believe in that, uh, in being not that much uh, heard, not that much understood how important is it, is now led to the situation that not even unknown uh, innocent people are tortured and killed, but also very well known human rights defenders, journalists, are targeted. And uh, by saying this, I also want to put some sort of responsibility to our colleagues abroad. I was sharing this with our European colleagues right now, Sweden is chairing now, and uh, talking to the uh, officials in the European community. On the level of responsibility, I believe we share towards those people in the region who are great enough to do their daily work. Uh, and I strongly believe that uh, it is complicated not to see that uh, they very much depend on how you react. If it is any public interest in your country, in Europe, towards what they do, because in our country, unfortunately, we have, as it was uh, described by uh, Dmitry, the approach towards, uh, towards uh, journalists, as it was described by Maxim, uh, we do have a very specific approach towards those people. It would be unfair to describe the situation in the Northern Caucasus just from a point of view of the human rights violations, which are essential and very important. Unfortunately, from the spring 2009, we have, we have a race of terrorism. 
um, that the terrorist units which have been uh, not active for a long period of time have been reorganized. Uh, more than 14 uh, suicide bombers attacks have been uh, implemented in uh, different parts of the Northern Caucasus. And we need to admit that these type of activities uh, are growing. We need to admit that it is not uh, the same situation in Chechnya and in other parts of Russia, although it is publicly announced as an equal by the uh, local leaders. We need to admit that real terrorism, not just a threat, but reality, exists. Civilians are targeted, not only officials. We need to admit that from the statistics we have, and also from statistics which is uh, provided by the initiatives of um, the CSIS here in, in Washington, it's quite clear that the number of uh, uh, attacks, <coughs> the number of uh, uh, operations is only increasing from both sides, from the sides of rebels and terrorists and from the side of the law enforcement agencies. This all is showing another feature for us. The feature which is quite clear. There is a fight going on within the society. Uh, more and more people are, are involved in that. I look at uh, finishing this um, uh, uh, main, uh, main just parts of the picture or the region, it would be unfair to say that we don't see any difference from what is going on right now towards what was going on during so many years. I do believe that there are new leaders and new uh, policies implemented in the Northern Caucasus. There are leaders who are trying to fight the corruption as a president of uh, Indusetia, and that's the main reason he was attacked and almost killed. There are people who are trying to uh, build up the trust, develop a dollar in the region as, as the leaders of Kabardino, uh, Valkyrie, uh, and Dagestan. There are such a new approaches on the ground. The thing is, they are unfortunately not that successful so far. Although there are new type of officials who are trying to think in a different way, it would be optimism to say in a negative type of way. Uh, and, and let me share this, uh, this optimism. Uh, still, these new policies are not dominating in the region. And let me share very shortly these uh, uh, five main uh, recommendations, which actually have been uh, published in an op-ed of Washington Post before the meeting of, of Bill Gates and Obama. And I know our colleagues shared these recommendations with uh, um, Mr. Obama. Um, I, I strongly believe that uh, there is a Ruska which was announced uh, within the relationships between Russia and the United States, the United States and Russia, uh, should really include the civil society sector. It is not just the governmental officials who are uh, in relationships. Uh, it's not okay that the governmental talks and the relationships are monopolizing relationships between our country. I strongly believe that this business should include much more local grassroots initiatives and we have very interesting uh, uh, results of the um, uh, Obama Medvedev Civil Forum, which was happening in July this year in Moscow. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Mr. Medvedev was not able to join it, but I strongly believe that if American NGOs, as well as Russian ones, would be interested in the real cooperation, new type of cooperation, not training, uh, from one side to another side, but a real partnership that would be strongly developing our societies. Um, the second is to um, really focus on the region which are, uh, faces crises. You know all <coughs> what was going on August, uh, um, uh, in the August between Russia and um, Georgia. We know all that uh, there are mistakes which have been clearly done by the uh, Russian officials, by the Georgian officials, but I want to address the issue of a frozen conflict region. For many years, this situation has been seen as a frozen conflict. The international community almost, almost gave up on it. And then finally, we got what we got that August. If it would be more active role, and if it might be more active role now in the Northern Caucasus, in the South Caucasus, 
more active role might prevent the serious crisis which we saw in the August. The third is to recognize the importance of uh, uh, media and new type of participatory media. I strongly believe that all fashion strategies based on 20th century approach uh, towards um, support to the um, existing media are not going to work. I strongly believe that in countries like Iran, countries like Russia, even in China, the participatory media might really involve the society in discussing and dealing with problems. And uh, the fourth recommendation comes from uh, forming new strategies which would be, uh, which would be uh, facing these new type of developments of the 21st century, where they see the essential role of internet, then they see the essential role of a public engagement, which might be so uh, differently developing the situation in the region. Right now, I'm not talking about the political developments. I'm talking about social uh, and uh, public developments, which we saw uh, are coming up from people nowadays in many cases, including the campaign we saw uh, organized during elections in the United States. And the last one would be to focus on uh, these approaches targeting people. Instead of targeting the decision makers, instead of publishing, targeting uh, those who are really in charge of so many issues, in charge of so many issues, uh, we have a chance always to work with people um, through social marketing uh, activities, through uh, any other public initiatives, through different uh, participatory media, internet editions, through those editions which are really popular and read by the Russians, by certain tiny groups of the Russians. I strongly believe that idea of working with values of the people. This word, value, was recently mentioned in the visit of Hillary Clinton to Moscow. Breaking the values of people is so essential. We're losing the battle of the public consciousness, at least in Russia. I strongly believe it is possible through op-eds, through independent coverage of the newspapers, through internet, through public awareness campaign, to work with people on the ground, not only with intelligence, and not only with the building makers, uh, those people who uh, right now, unfortunately, are not so much pro-liberal or pro-democratic. I strongly believe that these points are important ones to the direction of a new approach, new strategy that we are lacking. I strongly believe in Russia, in many of the post-Soviet countries, I strongly believe that in South Caucasus as well. And these new approaches, this is a challenge. Would we see any change? Or the change is just supposed to happen here in the United States? I strongly believe we need change as well of our foreign policies of our colleagues here. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And certainly appreciate the variety of issues and concerns that uh, that the panelists have raised. Um, I did have one or two um, sort of general questions. Uh, there were mentions of President Medvedev, and I wonder if the panelists could point to subs any substantive changes in approach to the media uh, under President Medvedev compared with his predecessor, current Prime Minister Putin. Uh, and just picking up on this last point regarding new technologies and, and media and so forth, um, I wonder if you could also talk about the challenges that uh, sort of the typical Russian citizen who's interested in expressing his or her opinion in utilizing these, and then um, also the adeptness of the authorities in utilizing these new technologies as well. I guess one of the thoughts that comes to mind is um, we might see somebody with an iPod or some outward manifestation of a buy-in into some of these technologies, but I would suggest that those types of technologies can also be utilized to reinforce uh, certain messages that some of the Russian leadership through organizations such as NASHI, um, which I see is pursuing lawsuits against foreign journalists in addition to uh, 
domestic lawsuits that have been brought by a number of individuals. So mainly the differences uh, in approach between President Medvedev and his predecessor, now uh, Prime Minister, and these new technologies. The Commission did, Kyle organized a briefing uh, uh, about a week ago or so on the use of these new technologies. So if you could uh, address that question in the context of the Russian Federation, that would be great. Thank you. Я знал, что обязательно будет вопрос, а с Путиным и Медведевым ли правда, что они разные? Well, I knew I anticipated this question about Putin and Medvedev. Uh, is it true that they are really different? Uh, я знал, что в Вашингтоне мы точно будем говорить о том, что они похожи на знаменитую пару полицейских из голливудских боевиков. Слово добрый полицейский. And um, I sort of knew that we were going to go back to this uh, old uh, cliche from uh, how the movie is uh, about the uh, good cop and the bad cop. I would say that one of them was a cop, the other one is not. <laughs> <laughs> Второе. Существуют действительно изменения в стране общественного мнения, которые возникают за последнее время. Это связано и с осуждением Сталина, и с очень жесткими выступлениями Медведева, адресованными продвинутому сообществу, меньшинству. Если Путин все время апеллирует к большинству, то Медведев нашел в себе силы апеллировать к меньшинству. Это важно. Um, and uh, uh, there's been uh, a visible change in public opinion recently, uh, primarily reflected uh, in condemnation of uh, Stalin, and um, also uh, in um, personal statements uh, made by President uh, Medvedev that was addressed uh, um, to the more advanced uh, members of the society, um, to the uh, small minority. That's actually the big difference between them. Uh, whereas uh, Medvedev uh, has the courage and mustered some uh, courage uh, to address the minority. Um, traditionally, um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Putin appealed uh, to the vast majority of Russia. Uh, but of course, uh, the minority that President uh, Medvedev is appealing uh, to is uh, defenseless. Никого из этого меньшинства или из оппозиции не, даже не зарегистрирован. Но когда такое количество фальсификаций на выборах, это показывает и страх большинства. But uh, when uh, we um, uncover facts of uh, uh, falsification of um, uh, uh, votes at the election, it uh, is a good uh, uh, testament to the fear experienced by the majority. This is uh, uh, Ms. Merkel. <laughs> um. Теперь по новых технологиях. Позвольте, я скажу еще две фразы, и на это закончим. Мы здесь сидели, и вы слышали звуки кортежа uh, канцлера Германии. Uh, ну вот эти сирены, сирены вы слышали? And we were just sitting out here, and um, a few minutes ago we could hear the sound of uh, police sirens. I suppose that the uh, German Chancellor was passing by this building. You heard it, right? А недавно мы занимались тем, как русский коррупционер по фамилии Бурлаков, украв 300 миллионов евро, решил купить в родной земле госпожи Меркель старые никому не нужные верфи. And uh, just uh, recently uh, we uncovered a fact, there were actually hearings on the allegations that um, someone named Bulakov, a very well-known uh, corrupt uh, official in um, uh, Russia, um, who uh, uh, 
um, unlawfully gained about uh, 300 uh, um, million uh, euros, and he was trying to use this money to purchase old, unused uh, shipyards in um, um, uh, Ms. Merkel's uh, home. Он типичный э, такой российский коррупционер. У него коллекция в 4000 э, очень дорогих мобильных телефонов, а на день рождения за 3 миллиона долларов у него поедал даже. And he's a very typical uh, Russian uh, corrupt uh, individual. Uh, he's got a best collection of uh, cell phones, about 4000 of them. They're very expensive and very exclusive cell phones. And uh, when he has a birthday party, Sir Elton John performs for three million. Вместе с журналом Шпигель мы расследовали его деятельность. I investigated um, the activities of this gentleman jointly with uh, their Spiegel uh, magazine. Президенты России и Германии вынуждены были обсуждать uh, вопрос о этих незаконных делах. Because uh, leaders of Russia and Germany were compelled to discuss this issue of uh, this murky dealings. Я обращаюсь в данном случае к господину Макнамаре, господину Паркеру. Я абсолютно уверен, что нам под эгидой комиссии по безопасности и сотрудничеству в Европе надо создавать информационное бюро по противодействию коррупции. Um, and this is my message to Mr. McNamara and uh, Mr. Parker. I think that uh, within uh, this um, framework of uh, commission of uh, cooperation uh, in security in Europe, we have to establish a panel, a standing committee on uh, fighting corruption in Europe. So, Mr. Transparency International, as well as jointly with uh, other government она должна строиться, работает комиссия на лучших журналистских материалах Америки и Европы. This uh, committee or commission has to build upon the uh, best work of uh, journalists in the United States and in Europe. Должна печататься белая книга коррупции. Uh, there's got to be a white paper or white book on corruption. Коррупция это ведь разновидность апартеида. Because uh, I believe that uh, corruption is just uh, one of the uh, varieties of apartheid. Это кража будущего. This is uh, stealing the future. Я очень люблю фразу, которую мы неоднократно печатали в газете, которая на слуху в России о том, что наша элита хочет править как Сталин, а жить как Абрамович. And I uh, love this uh, saying that I like to quote it was published in uh, uh, my newspaper. Um, the elites uh, in Russia want to rule like Stalin and to enjoy Abramovich's uh, uh, lifestyle. Вот для того, чтобы они не жили как Абрам, они правили как Сталин. Нужно сделать так, чтобы они не жили как Абрамович. Нужно преследовать коррупционеров по закону. But in order uh, to prevent them from ruling like Stalin, we have to pursue them and persecute them um, um, so they wouldn't uh, enjoy the uh, lifestyle of our moment. Thank you. country 
your situation and who uh, <coughs> would be able to contribute to country's development if they had a chance. And uh, uh, many of these people are uh, my audience, audience of uh, my newspaper. Uh, uh, we have a fruitful exchange of ideas all the time. And, and I, I feel their response and uh, I see that uh, there is that we have a lot of uh, people, not just in uh, universities or uh, non government organizations, but in government, people who work for uh, all kinds of ministries and uh, presidential administrations who actually understand very well uh, the limitations of uh, uh, current system of, of government. They just need, they just need. Uh, Coordination. They just need a, a, a feeling that uh, change can can be uh, brought about. That uh, uh, Russia currently is a, is a society which doesn't uh, doesn't believe uh, that change is possible. Uh, it's it's a moral problem in a way. It's not just. Um, it's, um, it's a social and moral uh, failure to, to believe that, uh, uh, that joint effort, collective action it may be uh, useful, may work. Uh, uh, so we, we definitely, we very much need uh, uh, from the little tiny successes on, uh, on uh, things like civil society achieving the success. Uh, press publishing something and achieving a result, however uh, limited and local. Uh, that's what we are working on, and we need the kind of moral support that uh, uh, foreigners uh, can provide. Well, uh, Robert, trying to uh, briefly answer to two questions you, you addressed, I believe uh, the differences that you can uh, point him on. Uh, in the media, um, in media approaches, I think might be seen maybe not so many examples. We don't see a substantial change towards media in Russia. We don't see how um, uh, independent TV stations, radio stations are flourishing in Russia. We don't see, but we do see Mr. Medvedev talking to Nova Gazeta, which is important, which is not only about the uh, material, but also a very important matter. We do see Mr. Medvedev publishing an article and uh, uh, opening a discussion about this article on Gazeta.ru internet edition. We do see uh, other steps um, uh, which do exist. Uh, they mainly are not about change of strategy, but in, in on the practical level, we do see uh, the difference. On the second issue, you raised the new technologies and the, if they might be utilized by the, uh, <coughs> what we call the dark part of the civil society, or it might be also not presented as a civil society at all. Um, that's the issue of uh, the debate uh, of academia. But yes, for sure it exists. I mean, it can be it's much more effectively used by male fascists than by liberals. The 2.0 platforms, sure. It is so. That's why it is essential to put attention. That's why it is essential to look towards these new approaches. Because those who want to uh, distribute hatred, those who want to distribute any kind of radical ideas, those who are terrorists, by the way, are very effective. Check out the YouTube. It's not about some forgotten Russian websites. How much you have in YouTube, like terror statements. How effective are videos of uh, terrorist uh, leaders? They are using it a lot. That's why it's challenging for us. For sure they are effective. What about our ideas? What about our messages? First of all, do we have messages? I think we have lack of messages, truly speaking. In Russia, there is the society. What actually we want to say? We can criticize officials. Uh, yes, for sure, they are doing a lot of mistakes. But what's the role of society? What do they have to say to this part of society which is, was described maybe minority? 
What do I have to say? Not too much of the messages I personally see. Not too many good and effective videos I see in YouTube, in other websites, and social networks. That's why it is a challenge. And you are right. But uh, being right, you are giving another point for me for us to focus on these new approaches, for us to uh, really think how to work within society, within the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now entertain any questions that you may have from the audience. There is a microphone uh, set up in the room here. Uh, we do ask that you keep your question fairly to the point. Um, and if you could start out with your name and any affiliation that you have. Thank you. Please press. Please press the button. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Alex Van Oss. Uh, I teach at the Foreign Service Institute in Caucasus Area Studies. And I was actually interviewed in June by the Caucasus not I was in Moscow. They got me by surprise. Uh, I want to say I have a bookshelf about twice as long as this desk, uh, books about Chechnya, and they're all grim reading. There's only so much I can read. And therefore, I'm fascinated by Mr. Shedow's suggestion that there need to be new kinds of uh, NGO projects that are perhaps different from this old style of journalism, which is very important to document what, what happens. What kinds specifically of new projects might there be? Thank you very much for, uh, for addressing this. Uh, I strongly believe that we have an old frame uh, in Russia specifically, but I think also in many other post-Soviet countries as well. The frame within uh, the human rights groups are trying to send as many messages, as many materials they produce towards our Western colleagues here in Washington, in Strasbourg, in Brussels, and many of the European and other capitals. Within this framework, it was expected that politicians here in the West would influence Russian politicians and they would make our life better. It's not working at all. It's not working not only in the 21st century, it was not working already in the end of the 20th century. I strongly believe that new strategies which are focused on the Russians are essential, which are focused on dealing with the people who live in their particular region are important. So that might be uh, social marketing strategies, that might be any kind of strategic communication strategies. We do have experience of these kind of projects and we do have the data which shows they are effective. They are making difference. They are changing things. And for sure that's not about political change. Personally, I don't believe in any orange revolution in Russia. I don't think that's a good scenario for the country. Uh, I don't think the political issues are the most important one for the country right now, I think the most important one, are these uh, issues when we are working with a social empathy, when we are targeting people in order not only to criticize officials, but to act, then they can act, then they can change things on the ground, and there are hundreds of cases like that. Be active, don't slip, just rise up and be active, because in many cases, uh, it's just a lack of information. In many, in many cases, in the caucuses as well, by engaging in solving the problem, by talking to officials, you can do the, do the change. Am I saying something bad? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I strongly believe that uh, Yes, we have a very different point of view in many cases. But the apathy is a major threat. And a lot of different specific stories, and even the stories which are very unfortunate, where the people keep them and torture, might be addressed, then the society rests properly. That's not only a protest which are needed. That, that's not only the meetings and the demonstrations which are needed. I strongly believe that, for example, in the caucuses, we do lack very much 
we had public discussion, debate. There are so many discussions and so many debates coming up to, back to the question you raised uh, on the hatred-based websites and discussions how uh, bad are Ossetians and Ingushetia, how bad are uh, Ingushetians and Ossetia. And so, uh, and so, uh, so much, so many of the uh, discussions are not taking place if we're talking about the future. What really? people do in order to change things in their thinking. So these specific scenarios, these specific projects, I think might come up from the people on the ground. And we do have such a people. So we need just a little more of work here in the people consciousness area, in the area of a specific projects which might make a difference. Perhaps we will hold up for the bells. I think you're good to go. Alright, good afternoon. My name is Karen Fisher. I'm from APCO Worldwide here in DC. And I'm wondering, given that the state owns and controls all of the media outlets in Russia, when you have a situation with a highly publicized case such as that of Yuko Soil CEO Mikhail Gorkovsky, uh, to what extent does the press become part of the Kremlin's strategy to fulfill its political agenda on top of the new inflation of the legal and judicial system against those like Gorkovsky? Yeah, given that the state owns and controls uh, most of the media outlets in Russia, when you have a situation with a highly publicized case, such as that of Yukos Oil CEO Mikhail Burkowski, uh, to what extent does the press become part of the Kremlin strategy to fulfill its political agenda on top of the manipulations of the likely and judicial system? So utilizing the press and the media as part of uh, their means to Perhaps we'll have to take another question. Okay, no problem. Thank you. We said we go ahead and have a couple of questions. Good afternoon. My name is Valerius Utsev. I'm a freelance writer writing and covering the COVID situation. I have a question for Dmitry Muratov and Grigory Shredov. Uh, for uh, the, the one for Mr. Murata, um, you, you, you mentioned that uh, Medvedev and Putin are not exactly the same. There, there, there are a lot of differences. You mentioned uh, the recent uh, statements. Um, but uh, what about actions? Uh, don't you think that it is possible that you know these statements are just you know just signs for that do not lead to any action, any real practical thing. What do you think about this? And a uh, couple of questions for uh, Igori Shredov. There has been a speculation that the fight, the, the killings in the Caucasus will stop after the fight in the Kremlin will stop. Uh, what do you think about this speculation? Do you think it is true or not? Uh, I, I particularly referring to, for instance, uh, 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 saying, uh, you know, the, the opinion that President Ivkurov was uh, appointed by President Medvedev, sorry, of two presidents, um, in, in spite of uh, Putin's, uh, you know, uh, skepticism, say, uh, so uh, about this. And another question is about uh, rise of violence in North Caucasus following the war in Georgia in August 2008. Uh, do you think there is a connection between the war in August last year and the rise of violence in your countries? I can only on the side. I can only answer some of I will be able to answer the questions only in part. Uh, 
у меня через короткое время будет очное личное интервью с Михаилом Ходорковским и Платоном Лебедевым. Суть вам такое решение. Um, Естественно, через адвокатов мы обсуждаем подходы к этому интервью. And uh, uh, right now, preliminary, uh, through the defense attorney, we are discussing possible approaches uh, to that interview. В частности, Кадарковский ссылается на ту статью, которую он опубликовал у Максима в газете «Ведомости», где Кадарковский говорит о том, что хватит ждать и интерпретировать различные сигналы, мы должны получить так называемое модернизационное меньшинство. Правильно я формулирую, да? Это Максим напечатал у себя в этой классе. Модернизационное меньшинство – это сколько-то миллионов людей, разные подсчеты, там, два, три, два, три миллиона человек, которые готовы были бы сами взять на себя инициативу по модернизации страны. And um, um, in um, uh, these uh, uh, negotiations, Kudarkovsky uh, is uh, referencing uh, his own article that was published in um, um, Maxim's uh, paper, uh, where um, he uh, is uh, saying, well, um, we shouldn't really um, uh, wait or interpret uh, the situation. We um, need to see uh, this uh, majority that is willing to modernize. He, call it, he calls it a modernizing majority or innovating majority. These are a few million people. Yeah, yeah three or uh, more uh, million people who would be able to embark on this huge task to modernize and uh, reform the society in Russia. And um, uh, this uh, article, um, I, I think uh, quite uh, justly resonated uh, with a lot of uh, uh, readers. I think that uh, eventually the Russian society should take full ownership of its future. It uh, should uh, take charge in uh, um, forming and shaping uh, the agenda and the plan. Медведев и Тарковский сказали одно и то же. And it might seem bizarre, but uh, looks like Тарковский uh, um, uh, uh, and Медведев were reading from the same page. Очень интересная история. It's very uh, interesting story. Putin's that much 
uh, but at least uh, we see this in his actions. Um, but uh, if the killing will stop uh, um, by the decision of the Kremlin, uh, that is really a very open question. I strongly believe that there is a role uh, which is essential of Kremlin in what is going on in the Northern Caucasus. But uh, it's already too late to expect to any of the bureaucrats to make a decision, sign a piece of paper in any of the tables, and then overnight everything will change. You probably remember uh, just recently uh, have been talks between uh, Kadyrov and Zakayev. And, uh, and Zakayev uh, uh, filed a statement that from now on, no more violence in Chechnya. Yes, what? Nothing changed. Um, Zakayev is certainly not a uh, that influential uh, 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 Russian officials in Kremlin, but unfortunately, my feeling and the information I'm gathering in the meetings which are off the record, just last Monday I was in Dagestan and many of the remote places of this huge republic, uh, is giving me a feeling that there are so many people who are ready to uh, fight, who are ready to organize terrorist attacks, who believe in things which is not so easy to understand, and I strongly believe in these things. And none of the decision makers would influence that. But that's already the good thing, that there is a recognition in a couple of regions of the Northern Caucasus, excluding Chechnya, that there is a need to talk, maybe not to those people who commit uh, terror attacks, but to a huge number of their supporters. Um, so the second, um, and, and, uh, and you also mentioned <coughs> on Yifkur, uh, um, you know, that he was, um, if I would really say that uh, I strongly think that he was attacked <coughs> not because uh, of the developing uh, terrorism in the region, he was attacked because of his fight with corruption, which shows on what uh, Maxim described uh, earlier, to what extent it is a real problem that the president of the regional republic might be attacked. Um, just due to such a reason. And the second issue of the rise of the, um, of the violence which is linked to the crisis and which we had um, uh, in August, we had a war. Uh, yes, I think that uh, we have in the region like the Caucasus um, military strategy implemented that certainly leads to the further crisis and further increase of violence. I want also to, to make a point for the further developments uh, in the Northern Caucasus or the whole approach of separatism. For many years, separatism was not anymore an issue. The Chechnya was uh, uh, lead, uh, leading and leading from this uh, discussion because of uh, lack of a leadership and lack of uh, real examples and many other reasons of responsibility of a separate state. But recognizing the uh, South Pacific, recognizing the Abkhazia people, not a region, but people, as those who has right uh, for the uh, independent state, the Russian state gave a huge credit to literally dozens of those people in the small nations which are as South Ossetia of 30 or 40 thousands of people to talk about possible independence from Russia or independence from the region they live in. Uh, and that's really uh, very much uh, developing the whole idea uh, of the violence. And that's very much the, uh, the solution which leads to the data, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I think uh, you have also met, uh, who wrote one of the articles about the sentence as well as the Logan Assetians. To what extent this is, a, you know, what, this is an issue even for Logan Assetian to talk about the Assetian state. Um, so very much, uh, I believe, today, uh, South Caucasus and Northern Caucasus are linked to each other. And the whole approach 
including the approach I see here in the United States and in Europe, in dealing separately. These are one country, these are another country. The approach we know from the ancient Rome. This approach is not uh, going to be successful because unfortunately today the terrorists, the rebels, those who promote hatred, they are very much in contact, they are very much communicating with each other. Those who promote, promote the different scenarios to actually uh, develop a, a, a community which is called now Imarat Kafkas. They certainly in contacts and, and they certainly work together and they are popular among the population in those regions. So by forgetting that this whole region needs um, some different messages and different policies and different steps than the military tanks and the soldiers marching. We are going in the direction which is not going to be peaceful. Thank you. Thank you. If you could identify your name. Yes, uh, my name is Yaroslav Martinuk. Uh, I work for Intermediate Research Institute. And my question to the panel is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, intermediates and other surveys have, have shown that the majority of Russians are quite happy with the media that they have. In fact, about two-thirds to 70 percent uh, say they, they are content with what they have. How does one explain this attitude? Uh, my, the second part of my question concerns also some survey results. Uh, surveys show that there is a very high level of anti-Ukrainianism, anti-Ukrainian sentiment in Russia. Uh, for example, only one third of Russians have a favorable attitude of Ukrainians, while in Ukraine the opposite is true. Ninety percent have a favorable attitude towards Russians. And as you're aware, you know, uh, President Medvedev wrote a letter to President Yushchenko accusing him of anti-Russian policies, which include the desire to join. NATO discussion of the 1933 plan of genocide, etc. This undoubtedly has few contributed to the uh, anti ukrainian attitudes. So my question is this: To what extent does this represent genuine attitudes of Russians, or is this largely or mostly a product of Russian media? We have another question here, given our limited time. If there's, yes. yes. Thank you, I'm from the US Ukraine Foundation. I apologize that this was covered in the hearing, but I was attending a meeting on the uh, Barney Karabakh conflict. <coughs> um, we and several other organizations operating here, like the Moldova Foundation, Baltic, and Georgians, believe that. We need to address some of these issues uh, on a regional basis. Uh, and by region, we mean uh, the Baltic, Black, and Caspian Sea region. Uh, and to that end, we're also interested in creating a network of information and media sources in this region. My question is, um, do you have cooperations with uh, organizations, media organizations, in this region? And if so, to what extent, or what, or what would you like it to be in the future? I think we have time for one additional question, which will be the final question, and then uh, we can have uh, about seven or so minutes for our panelists to respond. If there are any other questions. Uh, my name is Alex, my first um, intern for Science and Cardiff. Um, this is not really a question about conventional media. But, um, uh, it's a question about uh, do Russians have access to social networking sites um, such as Twitter or Facebook? Um, they, these were quite influential in the Iranian uh, elections. Um, they give access to the uh, public for um, a source 
Я отвечу на один вопрос от господина Мартонюка в отношении того, что россияне довольны средствами массовой информации. I will um, answer um, only one of the questions that were posed. Uh, there was Mr. Martin's uh, uh, question about um, uh, the um, sentiment toward uh, Ukraine. Такой вопрос мне неизвестен. Такой вопрос мне неизвестен. А какой социологический вопрос мне неизвестен? I was not aware of this survey. Если он был, то среди владельцев телевизионных компаний. Uh, if they ran this survey, I suppose uh, they pulled the owners of я могу с уверенностью сказать, что умные люди перестали смотреть российские официальные телевизионные каналы. А иногда смотрят, как у нас в анкете было написано, чтобы понять, что они хотят, чтобы я думал. Uh, official uh, Russian uh, TV channels. If they do watch them, they uh, do it just for one simple reason. Uh, they want to understand what the officials want them to think. Таким образом, телевидение спасает московскую канализацию. What I know for sure is it was actually proved by one of our reporters that during the commercial breaks you get a better throughput of Russian, of Moscow sewage system for wastewater. That that way our TV industry. Saves our uh, um, water sewage uh, section. Therefore, I'm very thankful to our TV for that. <laughs> Social networking is a, is a, uh, 
is a growing uh, um, area. Lots of people are connected, more and more connected, and that's um, where, again, quality press has a role to play, uh, because uh, as anywhere in, in, in the world, uh, networking is developing, but uh, quality journal journalism is not. Uh, quality journalism is suffering because of, um, of, of the market situation, because of the business model that's failing, because of uh, you know, advertising based uh, model uh, for financing. Uh, quality journalism is in crisis uh, everywhere in the world, and it will be in crisis in Russia very soon. We are lagging behind in that sense, but we will reach uh, that stage where we will have to face this. Uh, so networking is developing, but we, uh, the message that they're carrying is the message that we are responsible for. Uh, so we just have to continue doing what we're doing. And, um, uh, I think that's a tipping point would uh, point. Uh, somewhere would be reached when people just uh, wake up to, uh, to the scale of corruption and inefficiency that uh, is prevailing currently in Russia. Well, I, I can't uh, address the um, <coughs> Ukrainian um, question, but I, on the first uh, comment, I would say that from the data I know, uh, the level of uh, mistrust, uh, um, uh, the level of uh, belief uh, of the Russian press, that was the surveys which have been done by the Data Analytics Center in cooperation with Sarah Anderson, are showing that the uh, Russian media um, is not um, something which satisfies Russian as well. It's also very much a debate what we call media. We, you know, in the United States, a lot about infotainment. I mean, in the United States, it's, it's well an issue uh, in many other countries. And, but, uh, um, you know, if we're talking about the Russian TV stations, uh, if we're talking about the broader um, access uh, of the Russians to the media, I think we are facing uh, mistrust, misbelief, uh, the internet certainly, and uh, high quality um, you know, new newspapers is a different case, maybe a couple of magazines. Um, and so overall, I don't think the Russian you know, media is, the Russian population is happy, although uh, that's quite clear that uh, infotainment is very popular. And, uh, the digital population is much more happy than we think. On the issue, Nadia, you, you, you raised the um, uh, networking and the cooperation with uh, local sources. Uh, uh, certainly, um, you know, that's something in our work we do very much use, and I think that that's something which is very much needed. The question is to what extent this is a long term approach, to what extent it is developing and supporting those who exist there and independent from any groups of interest because in the Caucasus, including Karabakh and many other South Caucasus and regions, we do have uh, uh, very strange terms what is independent media. If media, specific newspaper or website, is dependent on a position, is dependent on some political figures which are in a position right now, oh, that's independent. Well, uh, I, mean, well, I would call it dependent media those which are professional, which, those which are not linked to any of the political or business frames, um, and, and uh, those I think are very much um, uh, lacking the cooperation, and cooperation in general I think is very much needed. But what kind of cooperation? I strongly believe in, in support and development of media. Not only support, but also professional development. Uh, which is addressing the standards which um, we're just uh, um, right now um, eliminating. And the last one, um, yes, certainly we have access to the uh, social networks. The question is uh, to what extent it makes a difference, to what extent it is used uh, as a social engagement tool, or uh, it is used just uh, um, you know, for a spending time. 
just for communication without any uh, meanings, um, without any leverage for the society. I strongly think that in Russia it is not used enough uh, to influence. And just for another meeting, giving an example of some of the article we published, which came fully from the social network exchanges and debates, which are going on, and then uh, people stop to sit uh, within uh, this uh, uh, computer uh, uh, um, friendly communication, but uh, just uh, got off to the streets um, to say what they wanted to say. In Rutik, of course, uh, we have my, my many examples of these kind of uh, things happening, and the social networks are playing the essential role. Um, I, I think uh, much more should be done uh, by the civil society in Russia and in many other countries in the southern southern provinces, because that's a challenge to us. Not too many things are done by the civil society to lead in these social networks. That's why uh, other people are leading there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes this hearing, uh, this uh, briefing rather, of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. We uh, definitely appreciate the presence of, of the expert today and certainly wish you all the best as you return to the Russian Federation. Uh, as I have indicated, a full transcription and other materials related to today's hearing will be posted on our Commission's website, www.cscd.gov. Uh, tomorrow within 24 hours. Thank you very much.